welcome to Reinvention and Restlessness, Fashion in the 1990s. This is part of the NAC at Home series sponsored by the uh, Club Fashion Committee. Shout out to my fellow committee members and to Mitch Case behind the scene who will be taking your questions that will be scrolling through this that, that I will see. Um, our, as uh, briefly, let me say, for those of you um, are not familiar with the National Arts Club. We are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote the public interest in the arts. And annually, the club sponsors over 150 different exhibitions, theatrical, music performances, lectures, I guess such such as this may be, uh, readings, and, and other events <clears throat> throughout the club and now uh, <clears throat> online as well virtually. And so for more information about the club, we are on all the socials, if you follow the socials, and we are also at nationalartsclub.org. Uh, and if you're interested in becoming a member <clears throat> or would like more information, please email admissions at nationalartsclub.org. Our guest tonight is a returning guest uh, and a good friend of, uh, of the fashion committee and of the club is Colleen Hill. She is a curator of costume and accessories at the museum at FIT. And yes, she is paid to collect shoes and handbags for a living. But more, more importantly than that, she has put together a great exhibition and book, uh, Reinvention and Restlessness, Fashion in the 90s, and just real quick, uh, Colleen, if you'll just give us just a brief, what got you interested in, um, in fashion of the 90s? What turned your attention to that? Well, I will give a few examples of, for example, some things that we've acquired in the museum collection over the past few years. Um, some books from the 1990s and very early 21st century that inspired me. And frankly, uh, my own interest in 90s fashion when I was living it. And I think that's what makes this uh, decade so exciting for so many people is that we all have memories or many of us have memories of 90s fashion and we tend to uh, look at that decade with a lot of nostalgia. Okay, cool. Well, I tell you what, as you and I and all of our viewers will join in wishing happy birthday to 90s fashion icons, Martin Marigiela and Mark Jacobs, all born on this day. I turn it to you and uh, reinvention and restlessness, fashion in the 90s. Fantastic. Okay, well, firstly, uh, thank you so much for having me. I absolutely love the National Arts Club. And as I told Gordon, I adore the audience. Um, so unfortunately, I can't see you all tonight, but I'm really grateful that you're here. And uh, this is my first public lecture about this book and this project. Um, as Gordon mentioned, this is uh, currently a book that is available through Rizzoli. It will be an exhibition at the museum at FIT, if not in the fall, then hopefully in the spring. Uh, and what I'll be talking about tonight, the categories that I cover, uh, the designers, many of the garments that you'll see from the museum collection are things that will also be included in the exhibition. So I hope you'll enjoy both the book and later the show. And as I mentioned, uh, I wanted to do this show in part because the museum has acquired some really fantastic pieces from the 1990s. Often the way that people offer clothing or the way that we are able to collect things goes in these sorts of waves. And I think the 90s is just long ago enough now that people are ready to part with some of these treasures from their closets or from their collections. Uh, so I've included a couple of examples of wonderful things that we've acquired recently. On the left, a Vivian Westwood corset top from her portrait collection from fall 1990. And on the right is actually kind of a hybrid. Uh, the tunic by Martin Margiela is something that 
we acquired a number of years ago, actually uh, not long after I started at the museum about 15 years ago. I was very excited to find this uh, from a vintage dealer. And then it so happened that a little more than a year ago now, uh, someone who has a collection of fashion came to us with a number of Margiela pieces and offered to donate the skirt, not necessarily knowing that we had the tunic, but uh, very luckily completing this ensemble for us. So just to give you a little sense of how the museum collects and how collecting over time can really help to shape some of these narratives for exhibitions. Another thing that I thought was really interesting about 90s fashion is, of course, its revival. And as I mentioned, uh, I was a young girl, a teen during the uh, 1990s. I remember it very well. I was already very interested in fashion, even if I couldn't entirely partake in high fashion. Um, and so I was really interested when I started to see, for example, FIT students wearing 90s fashion, sometimes vintage, sometimes just 90s looking. Um, and I also remember when Marc Jacobs released his Grunge Redux collection in 2018, walking past stores and seeing some of these looks in the windows, remembering them from the first time around in 1993. Um, and this is a collection that I will speak about a little bit later on, uh, but I think it's very interesting that we've seen this 90s revival in fashion for a number of years now, and it continues to go strong. And then as I also mentioned to Gordon, one of the things that really interested me as a fashion historian was going back to some seminal texts that I have read in the past, but that I consider incredibly important for shaping this show. I honestly found it challenging enough to tackle the 90s because it's, as I said, is a decade I remember, it's a decade with a lot of competing trends. I think perhaps more so than any other decade that I have studied. And I find it really fascinating that in particular, these three texts, uh, Fashion at the Edge by Caroline Evans, which I believe was published in 2003, The End of Fashion by Terry Akins, published in 1999, and Fashion Desire and Anxiety by Rebecca, Rebecca Arnold, which was published in 2001. All of these encapsulate various parts of 90s fashion really brilliantly. And as a historian, it's very difficult to assess what's happening in fashion kind of in the moment. And they all did a wonderful job of this. So I reread these texts and uh, they really helped to shape the way that I tackled this decade. Uh, as you'll see as I go through the uh, lecture talking about the book and the various parts of the book and the exhibition, I could not by any means cover every part of 90s fashion. So unfortunately, you may not see your favorite designer or your favorite trend, uh, but I tried to create a narrative that wouldn't be too sweeping, that would allow me to kind of dive into what I see as some particularly important ideas during this decade. And one of those relates a bit to uh, Terry Agin's book. And it's also show, exemplified here by this uh, look and advertisement by Franco Moschino uh, from 1990. And it's essentially the fear that fashion was just moving too quickly, that there was too much expected of designers. The pace was too quickly, going too quickly. People couldn't really keep up. There weren't really any meaningful changes taking place season to season because these changes were going so fast. Um, and so Moschino was someone who was often making commentary on the fashion industry, but he was usually doing that in a sort of tongue in cheek or sort of parodic way. And I think this suit is so wonderful, as you can see in this bold print, it says fashion, fash off. He's really talking about how things can ebb and flow so quickly, go in and out of fashion so quickly. Um, and he paired this collection, this fashion, fash off suit with the advertisements that you see here that actually said stop the fashion system and have this kind of vampire looking woman representing this moment. He actually had signs like this in the windows of his own stores. So he was really already by 1990 asking people to question what they were buying, how quickly they were buying it. And I'll come back to a little bit more of Moschino's commentary on the pace of the fashion industry as we move forward.
Another thing uh, that's quite interesting about the 90s is, of course, the phenomenon of models and supermodels, which really begins in the 1980s. Uh, here we have some models who, by this moment in 1990, uh, photographed for the Fall 91 collections, were already incredibly well established. These were four of the most famous models at the time, Linda Evangel Evangelista, Cindy Crawford, Naomi Campbell and Christy Turlington. Um, here they're walking the runway singing George Michael's song Freedom 90. They were also in the music video. Uh, and this makes a good point that I'll come back to again about how fashion was increasingly infiltrating popular culture during this time as well, which is part of the reason that fashion of the 90s, I think, sticks with us so much. Another thing to point out was the fashion show itself, and I uh, don't talk about this too much during my lecture, but if you purchase the book, there is a really great essay by my colleague Patricia Mears, who speaks about her personal experiences at some runway shows during the 1990s. The reason these were so significant is because we really start to see a shift in the way that fashion is presented uh, during this time. It's both made more public. For example, Helmut Lang was known for streaming his collection on the internet. That was a brand new thing. Um, but also just the way that clothing was presented uh, in this much more theatrical way than ever before. It had really moved out of these kind of slow paced, quiet, private shows um, for buyers and for the fashion press into something that was much more celebrity driven. So the way that we see models and actors in the front row at uh, many fashion shows today, it's really established during the 1990s. And I included this photograph of Shalom Harlow being sprayed by paint guns. These are actually the types of guns that were used to uh, paint car bodies. Um, and there was this very dramatic point during one of um, McQueen's collections where Harlow walks out. The dress was originally just a plain white design. As you can see, she's on this sort of turntable. And as she slowly spins, these paint guns sort of attack her and paint the dress. And then she sort of walks away exhausted and ends the show. So a very dramatic and um, really eye-catching presentation, something unlike anyone had ever seen before and really starts to set the stage for these more uh, theatrical runway shows. And again, the idea of the crossover between fashion and popular culture. And I speak about just a few films in the book. Uh, one of my favorites is Clueless. I think it's a, a real classic that even young people now still are familiar with. Um, and this was in so many ways such a fashion movie. Uh, in this instance, the uh, yellow suit, at least, that's worn by Alicia Silverstone is by Dolce & Gabbana. She was also wearing Anna Sui during the film. She actually mentions Azadine Alaya and Calvin Klein. Her wardrobe is really, in a way, its own character in the film. And of course, it helped teenagers such as myself uh, around the world really become familiar with some of these names and how important fashion was to Alicia Silverstone's uh, character. So diving into the components of the book itself, as I mentioned, it was a real challenge to tackle an entire decade in fashion. And so I ended up dividing the themes that I discuss into two main parts, reinvention and restlessness, which is, of course, the title of the book. And within each of those, I have four sub themes that I thought really helped to shape the framework of 90s fashion and continuing into the 21st century. So the first way that I discuss things is really about the reinvention of luxury, and that's done in a number of ways. The first is of which is minimalism. And what I always like to point out about talking about decades in fashion is that, frankly, it, it doesn't entirely work. Uh, it's not like suddenly minimalism came into fashion in 1990 and disappeared in 99 or 2000. Um, usually there's a sort of build up to these ideas and these styles, and maybe they even ebb and flow over the course of a decade 
certainly the case with minimalism. And of course, we're still seeing minimalism as a very important style within fashion today. So uh, what I loved about researching for this book was that because it was made during the pandemic, especially, I really had to rely on digital archives more than ever. And thankfully, there are really important magazines such as Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, which have been fully digitized and can also, of course, be searched by keywords. So one of the things I did early on in my research was search minimalism and minimalist to see what would come up. And what I found really fascinating is that it really is a term that is applied to 90s fashion forward. Uh, you see it used earlier in some instances, but it's nowhere near describing the sorts of clothes that we consider minimalism today. Uh, and it's not used regularly by any means until the 90s. So even if some of you are familiar with the work of Holston, for example, uh, who was designing primarily during the 1970s and in our eyes is now is very much considered a minimalist designer, he wasn't really referenced as such. So I thought that was quite interesting, as well as a sort of build up to minimalist fashion. Uh, part of the reason minimalism was so popular during the 90s was that it was viewed as a direct reaction to the opulence of the 80s when fashion was, if you were buying high end expensive fashion, it was meant to look that way. It was meant to look like you had spent as much as you did on your clothes. Uh, and so once we're coming down from that effect in the 1990s, due in part just to the shifts in fashion in general, but also to an economic decline that made that sort of opulence look a little gauche, um, we start to see this interesting transitional period. And I've included this Calvin Klein dress here because as you can see, it's completely covered in these shiny gold sequins. So it has that opulent material that you may expect from a high-end evening gown, but it's essentially a v-neck t-shirt dress. So in its shape and silhouette, it's quite simple. And there are a number of designs from numerous designers that take this idea. As in Inalaya was another who would use paillettes or these really intricate materials, but in the simplest possible Silhouette. So there's this kind of interesting transition from the 80s into the minimalism of the 90s. And I also found it really fascinating that there are these sorts of subsets within minimalism itself, and particularly really just in and around 1993, there is a trend toward what becomes known as the monastic look which is really based on the clothing worn by Amish people and also ecclesiastical garments. And they tend to be black rather than white. There's a lot of white in minimalism. Um, and they're usually long, they cover the body. Sometimes they're styled with tall hats and accessories that again, remind you of that sort of monastic look. And it is short lived, but it's certainly an interesting thing to note within uh, the minimalist aesthetic in general. And then, of course, there are fantastic examples of high-end minimalist clothing and accessories that we sort of take for granted now, but looking back, we're really so innovative. And the Prada nylon backpack, I think, is a great example of that. It was the ubiquitous luxury item of the 1990s, but it was actually so simple and made from a really inexpensive and incredibly durable material. So in many ways, it was sort of an anti-luxury uh, item, but it was, of course, made by Prada. It was very much the kind of it bag of the early to uh, mid 1990s. And uh, the story behind this is quite interesting because although Mucha Prada is of course incredibly important uh, to fashion and was throughout the 1990s, it's really important to note that she actually only began to design fashion collections in 1988. 
Uh, so she's already making a big impact, both in accessories and in clothing. And uh, right around this time, she also presented a collection of clothing that was made using nylon in black and white. Very simple, very minimalist. And if it had any kind of embellishment, it was usually just this little Prada logo, as you see here on the uh, pocket of the bag. And in the clothing, it was usually used on a little belt buckle. So very subtle. And I also wanted to point out that some of the designers who are considered minimalist designers, such as Jill Sonder, were essentially working in this way already for decades. Helmut Lang is another example of someone who becomes very famous during the 1990s for his minimalist aesthetic. But both he and Sonder, in Sonder's case, working since the 1970s, in Helmut Lang since the 1980s, and they were already working in this minimalist aesthetic that really became exceptionally popular during the 90s. Uh, and Jill Sonder is a great example here, that minimalist white that we're all familiar with, this kind of purity both of color and of line. And it was really the fact that these clothes were so simple. They had to be made really precisely. They were often using uh, high-end materials or using lower-end materials in the most innovative and interesting ways. Uh, so it's a really kind of fascinating moment uh, in luxury fashion. Another topic that I, of course, had to explore was grunge. And to be honest, at first I was hesitant to bring grunge into the picture because although it's very important, it was a real blip in high fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a really important blip. So I decided to include it here. Um, and grunge is also a, a reinvention of a sort of uh, luxury look. And I've included this photo of Marc Jacobs. I'm glad to include this, especially since it's his birthday today. Um, but as some of you may know, he had the most famous grunge collection of the 1990s when he was working for Perry Ellis. And these were pieces that were based on a look that originated primarily in the Pacific Northwest and really was related to the music scene there. Um, what, I what I found interesting in researching for this book was that the term grunge was actually applied to the music scene in that same part of the country um, from the 50s and 60s. And uh, Jennifer Lazote, a, a fashion historian, wrote a great book about um, secondhand fashion called From Goodwill to Grunge. And she did a lot of exploration of the term grunge and where this came from and how it played out in fashion. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things I like to note about the grunge look is that it's all about layering. And in fact, when I was speaking to a collector who's based here in New York, I don't know if he's here tonight, uh, but he has some of these Jacobs grunge pieces. And he was saying they're actually a little bit hard sometimes to find on the secondhand market because when they're not worn with their other components, it's kind of hard to distinguish them from other work by Jacobs or by Perry Ellis from this time. But nonetheless, these full looks, for example, the dress you see here on Lucie de la Falaise, uh, this vintage inspired pear printed dress, it's all about these layers. And the clothing was in and of, ex in and of itself expensive. It was made from high-end materials, but it was mimicking secondhand dress or the types of clothes that were bought at thrift stores. And these were the clothes that were worn by bands like Nirvana, for example. So it was really when these clothes and these looks that could have been replicated very inexpensively were made very high end, that they became a real point of discussion. And in fact, in Marc Jacobs' case, he was let go from Perry Ellis after presenting this collection. It was just a little too edgy, a little too off brand for uh, Perry Ellis at the time, but nonetheless really secured Jacob's place as the sort of arbiter of cool. And uh, during the spring 1993 season, there were two other important grunge related collections. Uh, this example, or both of these examples, 
uh, from Anna Sui, Spring 1993. And Anna Sui is always bringing a very optimistic and usually 60s and 70s inspired aesthetic into her work. Um, and again, you can see here how she's combined that with this grunge look, which did also include things like army surplus goods. Um, and of course, here you also see the layering and the Doc Martens. And uh, I found this all really interesting because the original grunge look is really about practicality, both economic necessity, driving people into thrift shops, and also the climate. If you're wearing lots of layers and the weather is changing quite quickly over the course of the day, you can more easily adapt to that. So there are these kind of practical reasons that this look was ever created in the first place. And then another great example from Christian Francis Ross from the same season. Um, I actually didn't realize until working on this book that um, Roth was inspired by the musician Kim Gordon, who was in the band Sonic Youth, also one of my favorites. Um, and so as you can see in this image, uh, the models were styled with these lanyards that were meant to evoke the idea of a backstage pass. And there is, of course, a really clear overlap and connection between music and uh, fashion in these looks. And I also wanted to include this um, looking through magazines, not just the more mainstream magazines, but also things like Dazed and Confused was really fun uh, for this project. And this was one of my favorite editorials, very bluntly called Fashion Sucks, and it's all featuring secondhand clothing. So it's essentially telling its readers, you don't actually need to spend a lot of money to look cool. And I think that was very much a part of the ongoing appeal of the grunge look. You didn't have to buy the Anna Sui or the Marc Jacobs if you couldn't afford it. You could actually replicate that in your own way. So it becomes very much about personal style. And then, of course, we also see many interesting avant-garde and deconstructed looks uh, during the 1990s, another way of reinventing luxury fashion. And I wanted to bring in who I consider to be the real godmother of this, Ray Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons, who was certainly designing uh, within the deconstructed aesthetic, not yet called that, but nonetheless really um, setting the stage for much of what we see during the 90s, the previous decade. And I've included a couple of, of examples of one of her uh, most innovative collections from spring, summer 1997, uh, Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body, also known as the Lumps and Bumps collection, where she essentially decided to completely ignore the natural shape of the body in many ways and add these sort of pads and um, bumps randomly around the body. And what was so interesting reading about this collection was it's not meant to be a very commercial look, but it was sold in stores. And in fact, the Museum of FIT has an example from this collection. And you'll find that they're much less bumpy in life than they are on the runway. And that was because it was really hard for many fashion editors and also, of course, salespeople to pitch these looks to people. They're, they weren't quite understood. So often you see uh, that some of the padding has been removed or placed a little bit differently so that it looks more uh, mainstream, if you will, and more commercial. Uh, so it's really fascinating to see what these looked like originally and in some great fashion editorials, such as this wonderful Mark Borthwick for Purple um, editorial. And again, our, our another birthday boy and one of my favorite designers from this uh, time period, Marta Margiela. This is a shot from one of Margiela's very first runway shows. And in contrast to those really spectacular, polished, expensive shows that I talked about um, very early on in the presentation, Margiela was someone who was always putting together shows that were completely unexpected. Um, in this instance, he staged the show in an abandoned playground in a far-flung district in Paris. Uh, people were literally climbing over walls to try to access this. As you can see in the uh, left, uh, kind of bottom corner, there's a little boy in this photo. He was a little boy who lived in the neighborhood. There were all sorts of kids 
who lived in the neighborhood and became part of this. They were on the runway, they were carried on the shoulders of models. So it was a very sort of impromptu thing. And as you can see, Margiela's clothes completely stand out. They're repurposed, they're worn completely differently than you might expect. He really is the person who literally brings about the term deconstruction and starts to make clothing that is entirely original and uh, completely unexpected and is wildly successful in doing so. And one of the things that he brings into his fashion is uh, in some ways a lot of criticism. And uh, these boots, which are part of the Museum de Fatigue collection, can be seen as a look at the ephemerality of fashion. Uh, these are a denim material that has been heavily overpainted. And so essentially, these were only worn on the runway as far as I know, but if they had been continued to be worn, they would have cracked and disintegrated over time so that you would have seen more and more of that uh, denim fabric underneath. And that was very intentional. Many of Margiela's clothing, uh, clothes were meant to look worn already and then continue to uh, disintegrate and show wear over time. Uh, and Hussein Chalayan is also someone who's an incredibly interesting designer uh, now and during this time period. And what I love about his work is that it's always totally unexpected, but in very different ways. Um, Chalayan was someone who graduated from Central St. Martin's, which uh, was putting out talent like John Galliano and Alexander McQueen. Um, so it was a real hub for uh, fashion talent, particularly during the 90s, but certainly before and after as well. Um, and Chalayan, for his Central St. Martin's graduation collection, made his garments, buried them, and then unearthed them. Uh, so that was an interesting way, again, to kind of look at the uh, process of destruction and decay in fashion. But then he also did things like this. Uh, the airmail dress is something that he again experimented with while at Central St. Martin's uh, and came back to over the course of the decade. And as you can see from the few photos here, this is a dress that could literally be folded up and sent through the mail. It's made from Tyvek, like a shipping envelope is, um, and can also be worn sort of like a 1960s style paper dress, if you will. Um, so it's a really interesting design. And if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to see the entire process of how it unfolds, um, there's a series of images available on our website that show you that it's a little complex. So I just included a few here. And then I also wanted to point out a uh, new talent like Maria Cornejo, uh, who is someone who talked about how she was inspired by designers like Rei Kawakubo um, and Jamila Meester is another designer who becomes very important during the 1990s and talks about how the Japanese avant-garde designers were particularly influential to them. Uh, this is a great photograph again by Mark Borthwick that uh, has this really avant-garde appeal in the way that this train has been sort of draped and bolstered, but you could also imagine how this could just be worn as a sort of train or sash from the shoulders. So it does have a little bit more uh, commercial appeal, but nonetheless comes from this place of uh, interest in the avant-garde. Um, one of the things I like to point about, out about all of these designers, particularly Kawakubo and uh, Margiela, is that they are designing in this really innovative way. It's very deconstructed. Often it looks worn or worn out, but it is luxury fashion. It's often one of a kind fashion, in fact. So uh, it's good to recall that uh, these designers were working outside of the box, but not completely outside of the fashion system, if you will. And then we have a really interesting revival, revival of uh, more established luxury labels. So we talk a little bit about minimalism uh, and how overt luxury was seen as a little bit gauche. That only lasts until about mid-decade and then you start to see a real revival of some of these more traditional uh, luxury fashion houses. And I really think this starts with Tom Ford for Gucci. Um, he was someone who had been working at Gucci for about five years before he makes a really important, incredibly well-known collection in uh, 1995. And 
what he does is quite brilliant because he's kind of combining a few of the things that I see as very important uh, during the 1990s. Um, one of which is minimalism. So these looks in particular really resemble some of the um, looks that I mentioned earlier by Holston during the 1970s, for example. Uh, so they're working within the minimalist vein, but they're very sexy. And they're also, of course, a little bit retro, which is something I'll talk about uh, moving forward. So it's kind of combining all these ideas and coming up with something that's not exactly new, but looks really fresh from the 90s. And it's very, very popular. And so Tom Ford really sets off this frenzy among high fashion houses to get hip new designers in place. And uh, just to give you a sense of how important this was, uh, Gucci was essentially bankrupt in the early 90s. By the end of the decade, it's worth billions. So Tom Ford really did have a tremendously important impact. And so this is when we start to see uh, a number of British designers, actually, and American designers take over established uh, French couture or luxury houses. John Galliano actually starts out at Givenchy. He's only there for about a year before he is bumped over to Christian Dior, all within the LVMH realm. Um, and he, although he was a little bit quieter at Givenchy, becomes an almost instant, instant success at Christian Dior. He's got a, a tremendous mix of references. Um, he's looking at global culture, something I'll talk about a little bit more moving forward. He's looking at the uh, traditional 1950s look of Christian Dior himself, as you can see in this really hourglass shaped uh, ensemble. He's really bringing in all sorts of theatrical, historical, um, beautiful references that become uh, incredibly important to 90s fashion. But when he leaves Givenchy, that leaves a spot for another designer, and uh, that designer is Alexander McQueen. Uh, this is a really beautiful example of one of his garments for a McQueen collect, or a, excuse me, a Givenchy collection. Um, and what's really interesting is right around this time, 96, 97, you see a lot of press about these changes. Who's going to be at which house? Who's being hired where? And there's an entire article where McQueen says, I'm not going to Givenchy. It's already rumored at that point. He says, I'm not going to Givenchy. I don't speak French. I'm not interested in living in Paris. And that's just too much work. And then a couple of months later, he signed on at Givenchy. And just to give you a sense, kind of going way back to that Moschino ensemble that I spoke about earlier, um, Working for his own label and for Givenchy meant that McQueen was responsible for 11 collections a year, which is a huge amount of work. Um, so you can imagine why so many of these designers were incredibly burned out and uh, McQueen only stays uh, at Givenchy until 2001 and then leaves to focus on his own label. And again, this really starts to uh, set off this wheel of designers who are being de uh, asked to design for these luxury houses. Uh, Chloe is a brand that was overseen by Karl Lagerfeld for much of the 1990s. He was already, of course, very successful at Chanel. It wasn't quite translating as such to Chloe. Uh, so they let Lagerfeld go and hire Stella McCartney in his place. Of course, Stella McCartney is incredibly established now, but she was a very young uh, designer at the time, just out of Central St. Martins. It was really unknown how successful she would be at a label like Chloe. She immediately proved to be very successful. Um, and I actually remember this exact dress and still love it um, based on vintage lingerie that McCartney found at a flea market. Um, and basically, uh, this again sets off a trend. We have Michael Kors for Celine, we have Narciso Rodriguez for Loewe, um, Nicola Gasquier gets hired at Balenciaga, Marc Jacobs at Louis Vuitton, Marta Margiela at Hermes. All of this happens between 1997 and 1998. So you can really get a sense of how Ford's impact made an impact on other fashion houses as well.
And now I get into the idea of restlessness. And this restlessness really comes into play because we're at the end of the 20th century and at the dawn of the new millennium. And I think there's a lot to be said for something like retro revivals. Not that any of uh, this idea of historicism in fashion or looking back at old styles to inspire new styles is new to the 90s. It certainly isn't. But I argue that this type of looking back happens at a much quicker pace than ever before. It's overlapping sometimes in collections by designers like Vivian Westwood or Jean-Paul Gaultier. They are looking at multiple decades, if not centuries, in a single collection. So it's this kind of quickly revolving door of retro inspired styles. This by Westwood, who is one of the designers best known for making these really great historic references. This is a Renaissance inspired look, uh, a sort of 19th century Lacroix look. And again, one of my favorites, uh, Anna Sui, looking at a sort of 1970s doing 1940s style. So this is multi layered way of uh, looking at retro style. So I won't linger too much on this. But I do want to talk a little bit more about technology. And I very briefly mentioned uh, Helmut Lang showing his collection first on CD-ROM and then later having it available on his website um, in 1997. But there's all sorts of really interesting overlaps between technology and fashion in the 90s, sometimes only referenced as a sort of look other times truly using technology to inspire the way that fashion is made. And so this is an example of the inspiration and in how fashion was made. Um, Miyake launched his Pleats Please line in 1993. Uh, it was essentially based on this idea of pleated polyester that was also uh, less expensive. So people could buy a Miyake piece a little bit more easily. It was a little more accessible than his regular collection. Um, and he does all these really beautiful, interesting, usually solid color pleated pieces. And it's in 1996 that he takes a new direction with these and begins to collaborate with artists to make uh, pieces that are printed with various artworks. So there's a close up here in this beautiful photograph by Mario Rizzi. We, of course, have an example in the museum at FIT collection. What makes this so special is thinking about the way that not only it was made, but that it was made in 1996. I think that's very important um, because essentially the design had to be manipulated, stretched out so that when the garment was pleated, the artwork was in perfect proportion. So again, we're talking about 1996, doesn't seem so profound now, but really was a, a technical feat at that time. And then we also have a great example, again, from the Queen for Givenchy. Now we're in the fall, winter 1999 collection. People really are thinking a lot about technology with the dawn of Y2K, the fear that rather than turning over to the year 2000, computers would somehow go back to the year 1900. It was a real fear. There's an entire uh, psychological journal from 1999 about people who were absolutely terrified that the world would just stop. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But you see a lot of references uh, to this kind of thing in fashion. And this is a great example. Um, the collection itself has a lot of pieces that were beaded or printed with a sort of circuit board motif. And then at the end of the collection, the model walks out. Um, this is a kind of moody photo, but hopefully you can see that she's uh, wearing a molded, a plastic molded bodysuit and helmet that has that circuit board motif that then lit up with uh, LED lights. So really, uh, again, incorporating technology directly into the garment. And this is a sort of uh, transitional piece in a way. I uh, love the film Party Girl. I'm not sure if uh, anyone's familiar with it. I think it's wonderful. It's available online and it was always available online. It was actually the first film to debut online with a little intro from Parker Posey and then the film was played. Um, I included a couple of stills here uh, because I adore Parker Posey's wardrobe. Um, I love that she's actually wearing uh, the 
same jacket, for example, a few times during the film, there is a really great scene. She's this sort of perpetually broke fashionista. And there's a really great scene where she goes into a secondhand store to sell some of her clothes and she gets almost nothing for them. And she's so offended that she has, you know, this great Todd Oldham piece that on the secondhand market doesn't get as much as she'd hope. So there's a real sort of reality around getting the wardrobe that you want, uh, which I love. Um, and it makes this interesting transition into environmentalism because some of the pieces that Posey was wearing in the film uh, were secondhand or were uh, vintage. And so there's a real mix in uh, her styles. And we're seeing the idea of both secondhand fashion or vintage fashion, but also eco or ecologically inspired fashion really start to come into play. And again, Moschino, as someone who was consistently looking at how fashion was being produced and consumed, became very interested in eco fashion um, just before his death. So unfortunately, this is, I believe, his last collection before his death. Um, and he didn't live to see, of course, the rise of sustainability today. I'm sure he would have been a big part of that. Uh, but he has an entire label that he calls E Couture. And he uh, produces a number of clothes. He uh, actually patented this Save Nature with this little smiling tree. Um, the jacket itself, it's kind of hard to see, but it does say something like, please don't put this in a trash bin. Um, so he's really, again, starting to think about how um, fashion can have less of an impact on the environment and just overall be made in a more uh, sustainable way for designers and for the planet. And this was a really fun find for me. Um, we wanted to include a photo of Bjork in the book, and we actually did include a couple, including this one. Um, and Bjork was always wearing the coolest clothes. The problem is they're not always identified. So unless it's something that really struck me that I'd seen in life or that I'd seen in another editorial or that was really obviously Helmut Lang or something, it was hard to determine what she was wearing. Um, so I was working late one night looking for a great Bjork photo, came across this, um, and I was so excited because she's wearing one of my favorite pieces from the 90s uh, by Marta Margiela, which is a sweater made from army socks. So it's something like 12 socks that are cut apart and uh, pinned and stitched back together. You can get a little bit of a sense here that the um, heels of the socks were positioned so that they curve over the breasts and over the elbows so that the sock uh, or so that the sweater also takes the shape of the body. So a really fantastic uh, photo by Rankin. And another favorite um, designer from this era, Lamine Couillette, designing for his label, Shuli Bet. We at the museum are really lucky to have a few ensembles from this designer, um, including this that you see here, which is essentially a series of inexpensive acrylic cardigans that he has cut apart, made into this fantastic dress, and then really highlighted how he's what we would now call upcycling these uh, pieces into something that's really new and fresh and exciting. And uh, Kouyaté was born in Mali, he was working in Paris, and he consistently spoke about how he felt that this reuse was incredibly important, uh, highlights a little bit of his African roots in the way that that was very important uh, to his own aesthetic, um, and certainly rare, one-of-a-kind, really fabulous pieces that uh, I have highlighted in numerous exhibitions and will highlight again here. And then I'll end on a subject that's a little bit touchier uh, called the global wardrobe. And this is essentially looking at the fact that uh, the idea of globalism was quite exciting during the 1990s. Uh, this small world, if you will, is something that's looked at by a number of fashion editors as a really positive thing. And as we move into those ideas, we would essentially consider much of this cultural appropriation today. And I talk in specific about uh, two overarching styles, 
there's a lot of influence from Africa. And I use that obviously talking about an entire continent with varied styles. Um, but that's usually the way that it's referenced within the fashion press as well. So we have an example from uh, Romeo Gigli, uh, inspired by corsets worn in Sudan. And uh, the other place that is commonly appropriated uh, styles, which are commonly appropriated uh, is China. And so here we have an example from Dolce and Gabbana from 1999. Um, and this is again, a, a tricky subject because it's something that's so celebrated in fashion during the nineties and looked at very differently uh, during the 21st century. So I did a lot of exploration in what this looked like. Um, this is an example from Vivian Tam and uh, she is uh, someone who is of Chinese descent, was raised in Hong Kong. She was actually looking at um, this uh, series of clothes that made these sort of caricatures of Chairman Mao. And she was trying to present this as a way to show a new China, a China that was freer and uh, more colorful. And in fact, this was not well received by many Chinese people. Um, even when we went to, oh, I'm sorry, my cat is meowing. Um, even when we went to uh, print the book, it was printed in China and this was actually censored out. So it's still a very sensitive subject. So just trying to point out that um, even when designers are looking at their own culture for, culture for inspiration, that's not always without problem. Um, and another example here of uh, how designers really need to be conscious of what references they're looking at. This is a really famous example of a Lagerfeld for Chanel Haute Couture look in which he thought he was embroidering a love poem onto the bodice. It ended up being a passage from the Quran, which was not okay and it immediately was um, called upon to be destroyed. Um, as far as I know, the dress itself was destroyed. The images were also asked to be destroyed. Clearly they have not been. Um, but I think this is a really great example of uh, designers needing to be incredibly cautious in the way that they are using works from other cultures. Uh, and then lastly, I point out here that Part of what made this so tricky is, of course, that uh, these ideas of cultural appropriation were just looked at so differently during the 90s. And so that's not to make excuses for designers by any means, but I think it's also really good to look at the bigger picture. And I've included this image from um, with Jean-Paul Gaultier's collection from spring, summer 1994 here, because Gaultier was especially fascinating to me within this realm of the global wardrobe. He's someone who consistently looked at other cultures for inspiration, especially during the 90s. You see all sorts of styles um, mixed and, and matched. And he was really well known for this, still is in many ways. And I was reading about what that might have meant to him and uh, how he thinks about it today. And I found a really great interview from 2011 where he talks about how he was raised to appreciate other cultures. All of that made its way into his collections, but he also refers to this practice as stealing. So by 2011, he's very aware of the implications that this sort of global wardrobe had. Um, and I like to point out that Gautier is someone who throughout his career consistently celebrated um, diversity in models and their age and their appearance. Um, he was someone who really celebrated all kinds of people and appearances. And so it's difficult to uh, pigeonhole someone into just cultural appropriation. So I tried to give a, a bigger picture uh, of this moment in fashion. And just to round things out, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are other essays in the book that are really fascinating that I'm uh, not touching upon this evening. One is by Patricia Mears, Spectacle Fashion on Parade, which is uh, in large part about her personal experiences at many of these fashion shows during the 1990s, which I think is, is really special. 
a fantastic essay by Shona Marshall about uh, changes to fashion photography during this era, which is not something that I was as adept at. And so she did a really wonderful job of explaining, for example, Corinne Day's work uh, and Corinne Day's uh, on both the cover and the back of the book. Um, and then a wonderful essay by Valerie Steele, the director of the museum at FIT, where she talks about the rise of fashion studies, which I found uh, particularly important because um, where I'm at in a fashion museum, talking to all of you about fashion, we didn't always have this kind of audience and fashion wasn't always taken so seriously. And scholars like Valerie Steele were really integral in making this a topic that is uh, respected and understood by many people. Um, so I hope that you all will have the chance to engage a little bit more with these topics as well. Um, and I'm going to wrap up now and I'll be happy to take questions. All right, welcome, welcome back. We've had, had quite a few questions. Um, I tell you what, I, one thing that is uh, curious uh, to me, and it, it's let me start with one of the last things you talked about is one of my first questions, but as a curator, um, and particularly at the museum at FIT, you yourself are very influential with young uh, young curators uh, or young students or students who are interested in becoming curators or students themselves of fashion. Let me ask you, what advice would you give a young curator today or somebody interested in it, say a burgeoning fashion designer, when they look at these images from, from the 90s and they see them and how would you, um, what would you advise them about cultural appropriation? How, how might they interpret those images in a more sensitive way today? Yeah, that's a great question and something that I, I usually bring up in my talks. I'm glad you asked it. I think um, my advice would always be to understand as much about the originating culture as you can work with that culture. If you're working directly with the culture, you have to pay them. Um, you have to bring this into a point of view of a collaboration rather than taking styles. And it has to be a collaboration or a partnership that is actually and truly fair to the originating culture. Um, so I think in general, being hyper aware of where your references are coming from. Um, I love websites like Pinterest. They're wonderful for gathering images. If you gather those images, do a reverse Google search, figure out where these things are from. Um, just be really cautious about what you're looking at. Um, you know, of course, we're all fascinated by the beautiful things that are produced around the world. But I think being really conscious of where they come from is essential. And there's simply no excuse to not figure it out in the digital age. Thank you. That's I, I, I learned a lot from that because sometimes even even I, uh, you know, as a, not a student, not a curator, I, I I'll be honest, I struggle with that too. I see um, designs and I go, oh man, do they know what? Do they really know what they mean? So thank you. That's great. That's great advice for that. It'll be interesting to see how the um, uh, appro cultural appropriation um, conversation continues. And related to that, it's a you know you 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 comment, um, and I think rightly so about how the speed of um, there was a quicker pace of fashion innovation and fashion. How do you think that has uh, led to our questions about sustainability and fast fashion today? Well, the fast fashion model is really uh, becomes part of the 90s fashion model. And I mentioned very briefly uh, the idea that um, Miyake was doing his Pleats Please line in 1993. And that was in some ways, although it looked very different and had a, a very specific angle to it, um, in some ways that was considered his quote unquote diffusion line. And in fact, that's something that really amps up during the 1990s. So the idea that, 
having a t-shirt with a designer logo on it because it's something that sells so easily and can make a big profit for the label. That's something that really takes off during the 90s. We also see the uh, fast fashion structure and uh, infrastructure come into play during that decade. So it's certainly setting the stage for uh, this hyper consumption that we are familiar with today, absolutely. And do you uh, attribute that to, um, you, you mentioned about uh, the, the, the vaunted LVMH empire and uh, at, the, at the time it was Gucci group and now it's curing. Do you think that so much of that focus on uh, profitability came from the nineties and these great brands, these mega brands coming in and, and basically hiring these designers? I, I don't know if it's necessarily the designers themselves, but uh, certainly in the case of, I think uh, Galliano for Christian Dior Haute Couture is a, a great example. Um, often the way that couture collections could and can survive is by creating these really spe spectacular clothes and presentations that sell perfume and sunglasses and t-shirts um, because the majority of us are not even buying Dior collection, certainly uh, not haute couture. Um, so I understand the need for these products uh, so that brands can survive and can in fact put out these really fantastic, creative, beautiful collections. Um, but I think we also can push that too far. And in fact, I would suggest again, going back to Terry Agin's book, and she actually has an update on the end of fashion as well, uh, where she talks about this idea of commerciality kind of overtakes creativity in fashion. And I think we're seeing that swing back a little bit the other way, but it certainly starts to take off during the 90s. Absolutely. Um, I guess this is this is a question everyone hates. <laughs> if you could name like that one specific person, event, one or two, the top top, let's say the top three people, places, things that you think were the most influential in '90s fashion. Uh, what do you think it might be? What, uh, uh, well, I think my my problem my... is that I have such personal memories of 90s fashion. Um, so I actually remember in, well, now I'm going to forget the magazine, but in Sassy or Teen magazine, one of those that I was reading, um, <laughs> they had a Shulibet design that was featured as the runway look that was desirable. Um, but then they had these mass market, you know, teenager clothes that emulated that style that were meant to be more available, but weren't even available to somebody <laughs> like me, still too expensive for my teenage budget. Yeah, well. um, but, you know, those are the, the sorts of things that stand out a little more to me, actually. Um, and I remember watching House of Style with Cindy Crawford when she was hosting that made a really big impact on my interest in fashion. Um, and I didn't end up working this into the book uh, because, as you know, uh, it had very specific categories. So it's certainly not covering everything that even I thought was important. But I also remember um, fashion magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar being at the checkout counters at supermarkets. <laughs> um, so even in the suburbs, uh, these sorts of things were very accessible. And I specific specifically remember buying an issue of Harper's Bazaar that had uh, a spread of Olivier Tescan's work, his very early work that was made, I think, from like textiles his grandmother had had, and there were the corsets with all the hooks and eyes. And uh, I was absolutely fascinated by that article and by him. And so I did look that up. I found it again for this um, <laughs> project, but it didn't end up making its way in. Uh, but I think it's very hard for me because I know a lot about 90s fashion, but then I also come back to my own like personal. I thing. know it, it, it was it, no one, no one, no one likes the what's your favorite or what's the what's the one thing because in, in a sense, they're all your children, right? They, exactly. They, yeah, you like, you, you, you like them all. Um, well, and indeed, as as do I, it's difficult for me. I like them from many from many different things. And 
I think I know the collector that you were talking about. And sometime you and I will have to get him in a dark alley and find out where he really gets some of those things because he has amazing pieces. Um, he was, in fact, uh, the reason that I knew that today was his birthday. <laughs> yes. He yep. Because he posted it on, um, on Instagram. But I think what... <clears throat> That aside, what is so interesting is um, that he's able to find some of these pieces. And so um, for our, our audience out there who's not a per se fashion collector, um, to take that, in, that as an inspiration, how can they be a little more 90s? Where can they find some of these things? Um, where, um, if you wanted to say, um, find, clothing inspired by the times or from the times themselves, where might be a place that, that, that our viewers could find? We have some of our questions about, they, they uh, uh, don't know, they're fascinated by it, but they don't know where to, where to access it. Where, where sure. Just... Um, well, I think that in general, 90s fashion has been in numerous collections for a, a while now. Um, if you're not I personally uh, buy almost exclusively secondhand or I, I buy from sustainable brands. Uh, if I buy new, I buy from sustainable brands. So I'm not the best to say where to shop except for Etsy, <laughs> which is actually <laughs> up this, which is vintage Anna Sui. There we um, go. So yeah. I think that's a great resource. Um, the Real Real is actually now selling uh, vintage fashion, which extends to the 90s. So if you're looking for Helmet Lang, for example, they had a gorgeous late 90s Helmet Lang on their site for a while that I was really interested in, but missed out on getting. Um, so I would say if you're thinking about the need for sustainability and 90s fashion, looking at some of these uh, secondhand sites is the way to go. Okay. And then finally, we've had someone who, who did ask an interesting question in the question box. Um, about the influence of Rick Owens in, oh, in, yeah. in, the, in the 90s. And, and I think uh, since you touched on some similar themes, maybe if you'd be kind enough to, to share us your thoughts about Rick Owens. I would love to talk about Rick Owens because he it's is all great. Yours. <laughs> um, we have a really cool jacket uh, in our collection at the museum at FIT that is very rare. Um, it's on our website. So if you go to our online collections, uh, you will be able to see it. It's photographed. And basically, Rick Owens was only just getting his start in the 90s. And so what's interesting is that he, like so many designers, uh, I think he was working at a, another label like anonymously in LA, and um, he had no money to purchase the fabrics and the things that he wanted. So he kind of like a couple of the other designers that I mentioned was going to army Navy stores, uh, surplus stores, and he purchased uh, canvas bags in that army, that khaki uh, green color and took them apart and constructed them into a jacket, which is absolutely gorgeous. It has the little peaked shoulders that are kind of Margiela style peaked shoulders, very slim fit. Um, it's a, a patchwork kind of effect because it's made from numerous bags and the bags do show signs of wear. Um, so it's a really, really stunning piece. So I actually included him in um, my avant-garde and deconstruction section because it is a very deconstructed looking garment. Um, but he was really just only getting his start then. So I would say he's more of a, a 21st century guy, but um, already, even with no money, doing incredible things. Oh, well, tremendous. Well, well, he's definitely influential today and seems to um, be always on the radar screen um, as still kind of, I hate, I'd hate to say vestige of the 90s, but he certainly still channels the 90s. <laughs> Definitely. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. He does and, a sort and, of 21st century deconstruction. Totally. Right. Exactly. Well, what a wonderful hour. Thank you for your time and, and everything. This oh, is my pleasure. a great, a great update um, on uh, the nineties. It, it seems, uh, it seems like only yesterday and yet it, it in fact has been much longer than that. <laughs> so. Yeah. I feel the same way. It's kind of shocking. <laughs> Before we, before we ring off, um, what 
What's next for Colleen Hill? Uh, you are in the process of getting your PhD still? I am, yes. I'm a PhD candidate at London College of Fashion and um, obviously still a curator at the museum at FIT. So when we reopen, I hope you all will um, follow us on social media, etc. because I hope we can reopen sooner rather than later and safely. Um, we'll have a show first called Ravishing the Rose in Fashion, which I know NAC had a presentation about. Um, and that will be uh, in our special exhibitions gallery and following that will be 1990s. They're both fabulous in totally different ways. Um, so I hope that you all will keep an eye out and uh, any of you in New York or um, who are able to travel to New York will come and see these exhibitions. Oh, well, tremendous. Thank you for that. And um, the website, the museum website is easily uh, accessed um, just through a Google search. So those of you who are interested can definitely find, uh, find the opening date. Uh, when, not if, it will occur. And we're all looking forward, <laughs> absolutely all looking forward to that. And once again, it's it's always a pleasure to welcome you to the club and thank you for your, your time, talent, expertise. Um, it, it's really added greatly to um, to the fashion series. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks to all of our, our viewers. And thank you to all of our viewers. <laughs> it's, always, it's always a pleasure. And hopefully we can all be back in the gallery soon and enjoy um, enjoy enjoy the club in person. But uh, thank you again. Thank you. Good night, thank everyone. You, one and all. Good night, everyone.